Give me control of the country's money, and I don't care who makes its laws. That is a quote that is generally attributed to one of the Rothschilds. Now, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's far from clear whether any of the Rothschilds actually said that. But still, I really like the quote, because it shows that when we're using something every day, when something really is the backbone of our economy, then we should probably know how it is controlled. And that is exactly what we're going to look at in this lecture. All right, so this lecture is actually based on uh, the book, on the first version of Bitcoin, Blockchain and Crypto Asset, the German version that was released in 2017. And uh, later we refined uh, this framework in an article that we have published with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, it's joint work with uh, Professor Alexander Berenson. And what we are arguing is that any monetary unit um, can be described in terms of its control structure. So there are really three dimensions uh, in which you can describe any monetary unit slash payment system. And uh, the first one is its creation. So you have to ask yourself, how is this money created? Is it created in a monopolistic way or is it created competitively? So can anyone just introduce new monetary units or is this something with uh, exclusive privileges to one single um, centralized uh, entity or a pre-specified group of, of entities which can exclusively create these monetary units? The second one is the representation. That's quite easy. Uh, it's the question of whether something is physical or virtual. And in this case, physical meaning that there is a that it is attached to a physical representation to an actual object, and virtual means essentially mm, that it is uh, a ledger entry that is something that is completely detached from anything physical. So it's basically just uh, a book entry in a in a database. And then last but not least, transaction processing, which is also really important. It can be centralized or decentralized, and it, it essentially is the question of the, do you need the help, do you need the permission from, from any centralized uh, intermediary in order to being able to transfer your money, your monetary unit? So is it possibly for me to hand over my monetary unit without asking anyone else for permission? So even if they don't support me, even if they don't want me to transfer it, can I still do it? Okay, and these really are the three dimensions. So uh, here... Um, you have the representation, physical and virtual. On this axis here you have the creation, monopolistic and competitive on this axis. And here you have the transaction processing, which is centralized and decentralized on this axis. Now we can start um, putting in various um, monetary units and payment systems. And the first one is really cash. And cash is quite easy, of course. It's physical, so it's right here on this axis. Its um, creation process is monopolistic. Um, it gets issued in, in, the, in the case of bills, it gets issued by the central bank here in Switzerland. In the case of uh, coins, it gets issued by the government in Switzerland. But usually, I mean, no matter what the institution is and the exact details, it is monopolistic. It is restricted to a certain set and usually just one entity that can create this money. Okay, so that's for cash right here. And then the transaction processing is decentralized. Why do I say that? Because with cash, as mentioned in the previous lecture, you don't have to ask anyone for permission. If I, if I want to pay you with cash, I just can give you the cash, right? I can walk up to you, hand you over the bill or your coins, and that's it. And we, we don't need any infrastructure. We don't need to ask anyone else for permission. Now let's go with commodity money. Um, for example, uh, you could go with gold. Again, of course, when you have a gold bar or a gold coin, uh, it's physical. Uh, but the creation can be competitive. Now, in, in some cases, of course, uh, there are some imprints and there are exclusive issuers, but the general concept of commodity money, the general concept of having an ounce of gold is in fact competitive. Uh, anyone could do that, anyone could create it, anyone could introduce these gold coins. If they have the same denomination, if they have the same gold contents, they could still be valuable, okay? And then same argument as with cash, they are handed over. Um, a decentralized way, so you don't have to ask anyone for permission, you don't need any infrastructure, I can just give you this gold coin or this gold bar or anything like that. Uh, it simply works. Now let's go with commercial bank deposits. And commercial bank deposits are really just ledger entries within commercial banks, okay? So 
They are, of course, virtual, since they have no uh, physical representation, no physical attachment. Um, they are created competitively because th there are many of these commercial banks and in fact they are introducing this money. They are introducing the vast maturity of monetary units in our economy. Uh, so it's created competitively. And in terms of the transaction processing, it's heavily centralized because all they can do is issuing a payment order, hand it over to your bank, and, uh, and you, you, you are dependent on these commercial banks because hypothetically speaking, and uh, luckily that doesn't happen uh, a lot, but hypothetically speaking, uh, when there are some issues with the system, when there are weak institutions, when they are getting influenced by someone, by special interest groups, they could simply block your payments. So uh, when, when, when things go wrong, when there is a a really bad political shift, let's say, hypothetically speaking, they could block your money for no reason whatsoever. And that's uh, that's one of these issues here with the centralized transaction processing. And then we talked about the Yopstones in the last lecture, and the Yopstones, they're really interesting. With the Yopstones, when you think about it, since they have been detached from the actual stone, so we're really talking about the monetary unit that is out there, but it isn't part of the stone itself anymore, it becomes a virtual unit. It has a virtual representation. Okay. Now the transaction processing, since you're not reliant on any specific centralized institution, since you can start with your ghost gossip process and then just tell, tell anyone in this community, it, it, can, it can be argued that it's decentralized. You don't have to go through a specific institution. You just have to start a room or have to start spreading it. Uh, it's all fine. So it's decentralized. Okay. And then last but not least, uh, we talked about the creation we talked about the fact that uh, they built these canoes and paddled to this different island called Palau, and anyone could carve out these stones, so it's really a competitive creation process. And these are really the properties from the Bitcoin network. It's, it's exactly the same. Bitcoin, as you will see later on, will also be in this corner. Uh, that's otherwise unique. That's that uh, for a really long time when we have been, we had a gap right here, no payment systems that could actually um, unite these characteristics. But when you think about Yop, the reason why it works is really because it's this small community. Because you have these close relationships and when I start cheating, when I when I tell somebody something that's not true, uh, then I might get punished. And these punishments, they can be severe because my outside options on, the, on this small island and when I'm part of this community aren't that great. I mean, you, you probably don't want to ruin your reputation when you're part of a really small community. I know exactly you're, you're basically you're stuck there and you have no outside options. So that's the reason or one of the main reasons why it works in Yop. But when we talk about Bitcoin later on, when we talk about other payment systems, then obviously we're talking about larger scales. We're really talking about global scales. And when you, when you think of a Yop-like payment system, it's it's in, in this context, in the global context, in the global scope, it's simply not going to work. Um, first of all, <clears throat> you have to ask yourself how are you going to transfer everything. So, um, how are you going to make your payment order? How are you going to inform everyone uh, when I when I say I want to transfer this yopstone? How does everyone know and how does the information spread? Number two, how can they actually find out whether a, a certain payment order, a certain rumor is legitimate. So when, when you hear that uh, I apparently I wanted to transfer a yopstone to someone else and you heard this rumor, you, you, you have this gossip going around. How can you make sure, how do you know that this message actually originated with me? And number three, of course, consensus. I mean, that this might not be an issue in a really small network. Information might travel um, quite easily. And also there might be some great ways like town meetings or you name it to establish that consensus. But when you have a global scale system where everyone has these lectures, and in this case, it would of course be an explicit lecture. Um, it's really hard to reach consensus when everyone has its own understanding of who currently owns what. And then it's really hard to reach a common understanding of the situation to have a common version of this lecture and that's really important in the payment system because a payment system obviously has no use when everyone has its own uh, its own copy of the lecture and a different understanding of what's going on so when we turn to the 
creation of money. Uh, let's first look at the competitive creation. And when you look at this figure right here, then you have the margin, marginal cost of revenue, uh, so the marginal cost of creating a monetary unit and the marginal revenue of selling it later on. So basically when you have produced it, how much you can earn from it. And right here would be the supply. So the more of these monetary units there are, uh, the further right on this axis would be, okay? So when we assume that anyone, and that's, that's in fact a competitive creation, that anyone can create, introduce new units of this monetary unit, um, then obviously anyone could decide to do so whenever the revenue, the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost. And you should actually do that as an economic agent when you're trying to maximize your profit and you see an opportunity that you can produce something that uh, realizes a certain revenue and that uh, you only have to invest an amount that is lower than this revenue, so you have a lower cost. And obviously you're going to create it economically speaking. So whenever we are here to the left of this equilibrium value, then everyone in this economy should have an incentive to create more, to introduce more of these monetary units. Okay, and so basically you have these effects that you will move until you are at this equilibrium point right here. And at this equilibrium point, uh, basically what happens is that marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, and then no one would have an incentive to introduce more of them, okay? No one would have an incentive to do that anymore because they know whenever I um, produce it, the costs are just as high as what I get revenue-wise, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Now, one simple example you could think of, and that would also explain why the marginal cost goes up and the marginal revenue goes down. One simple example uh, is gold, for example. When you're, when you're looking for gold and you want to produce new gold coins, then initially this might be really easy because there is a lot of gold in the ground, right? You can, you can basically, you can find it quite easily in a, in a gold rush. But the more gold there is found, the harder it gets to find new one. So the cost actually increased, the marginal cost for each unit as it gets harder. On the other hand, as always, when there is more in the economy, when you have a, a certain number of these gold coins already circulating, the more there are, uh, the lower the willingness to pay for these gold coins, okay? And since the marginal revenue goes down, marginal cost goes up, that's really, we know for sure that there is somewhere, and we're not specifying that, but we know for sure that there's somewhere this equilibrium. Um, and this is really an equilibrium value for the total money supply in the economy. That's, that's the basic idea when you have competitive creation. Now there could also be situations where the marginal cost really remain the same. And so when you, when you, when, distance yourself from the gold example, where it really depends on how much is already found. Um, but of course, still the marginal revenue uh, remains the same, because the marginal revenue, the more of this monetary unit already is circulating in the economy, uh, the lower the willingness to pay, generally speaking. So it will come down, and of course, when you have constant marginal cost and uh, 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 marginal revenue that decreases with total money supply, then you would still end up at an equilibrium somewhere. And also, again, in this case, when you have competitive creation, there would also always be this shift towards this equilibrium. Uh, there would really be this equilibrium value. And uh, in terms of the creation, there would be more money created until uh, the economy is at this in this equilibrium state. Okay, now the other case would be the monopolistic creation, where you have a certain set of actors, uh, usually a central bank, that can exclusively create these monetary units. Now, first of all, this is really expensive because you have to have all these counterfeiting measures in place. You have to make sure that um, really you can defend this monopoly, you can defend this exclusive right to create these monetary units. But let's assume that's there. Let's assume they succeed in doing so. Um, then what we really see is the marginal cost. Um, there is no reason to assume that they are increasing with uh, total monetary supply. But the marginal revenue, of course, still is. I mean, when you're introducing money, uh, more and more money, there is a certain risk of inflation at some point. Um, obviously, a central bank could not introduce just unlimited amounts of money. That would immediately break down any of the trust that is in there. So there is really a sweet spot, and they can freely set that. They have an active management where they can say, okay, the, the current money that is in circulation, so what, what currently what is currently available, 
we have some degree of freedom of setting that because we don't have to be afraid that someone else is just eating away the seigneurage right here and driving the economy to the equilibrium. We can, to a certain extent, actively manage that and creating a little more, a little less, okay? And that creates this marginal revenue. Um, usually, uh, it's not that they're selling the monetary unit. Usually, it's interest payments um, because of the way they're introducing it. But still, they earn some seigneurage. So with this right, that they can create new money, that they can lend it to someone, to these institutions, um, they can create some rev uh, some return right here, and that's that's what's used. That's what's usually referred to as seigneurage in monetary economies. Then, when we talk about the representation, I already mentioned that the physical monetary units. It's quite easy. It's just whenever it's tied to a, a physical object. Uh, so, for example, when you have cash. And the monetary value is really inseparable from that coin. It's really inseparable from that bill. Then we're talking about a physical representation. The pros are it's really simple. There are clear ownership rights. So you don't have to worry uh, whether this same monetary unit exists in two places at the same time because uh, physics. And uh, then, of course, the some anonymity properties. Um, there is no history attached to this monetary unit. It's really hard to keep track of it, as opposed to when you have a, a ledger, let's say, when you have a transaction history, it's much easier to keep track of where this specific monetary unit has been and to collect some data on it. And anonymity, uh, I know it sometimes is seen as this shady characteristic, but anonymity has actually a lot of nice properties. And I would make the argument that in some cases, even if you have nothing to hide, uh, it's still a useful property because there is no need for anyone else to know everything about me. And that's in fact what happens with some of the more centralized payment systems. And then last but not least, one of the pros is the, um, that there is no systematic dependency, that you don't require any infrastructure. And I've already mentioned that uh, in order for cash or in order for any physically represented uh, monetary unit to work. Cons, it's location bound. so. It's hard when you when you um, have larger geographic distances, for example, uh, safekeeping and transport, counterfeiting is also an issue, of course. And then the divisibility, it's much easier to divide something if you just have a virtual ledger entry, as opposed when you have a, a physical object and you must actually divide it, so cut it into pieces, that's in some cases simply not gonna work. With virtual money, um, this has no fixed attachment to a, a specific physical unit. And so it's really just this ledger entry, as I've mentioned. Uh, pros, you don't require a physical handover, so it's quite efficient in terms of transaction costs. The cons, it's contestable. Uh, so you must make sure that there is some consensus uh, in this database. Otherwise, you will run into issues. And yeah, that, that can be a big issue depending on the exact system specifications that you reach this consensus. And then the last, and that's really straightforward, transaction processing. So the way you transfer something, as I mentioned, can be decentralized. So you just hand it over, don't have to ask anyone for permission, or it's centralized. So you always have to go through this centralized intermediary. Now, for virtual monetary units, when they are centralized, then the transaction capacity, so the idea um, that you can actually make these payment orders, the transaction legitimacy. So the idea that you can verify whether this transaction order actually came from the uh, current owner and the transaction consensus. So the idea that um, the participants of the payment system have a common understanding of who currently owns what, uh, they can be easily achieved. Because when you have just this one instance, this one person, this one entity, you send the payment order to, they take care of the identification and they also adjust the account balances, then that's that's quite easy to establish. But the thing is, when 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 there is something going wrong with this entity, as mentioned several times already, uh, then it can also easily break down. With decentralized systems, on the other hand, with decentralized systems, it's much harder to reach a transaction capacity um, because who are you gonna um, who are you gonna call? Uh, who are you gonna send the payment order to? 
what, how are you actually going to initiate your payment? It's much harder to find out whether a transaction is legitimate because how are you going to verify it when you just hear it within the network? And it's much harder to establish a consensus when there is no boss, when there is no single centralized entity that has exclusive rights to say, this is the current state. So when, when everyone just has a copy uh, of this ledger and everyone has its own understanding, then of course it's much harder to reach the consensus. And that's why in decentralized networks, it's actually quite hard um, to solve all of these properties right here. So that is what Bitcoin does. I already mentioned it. Um, Bitcoin is also in this upper right corner, so exactly in the place where Yup has been. But the thing that's really interesting about Bitcoin, as you will see in the more technical lectures, is that it solves these three issues right here in really novel ways. And also that it works in large scale networks. So it's not restricted, it's not limited to these small scale economies, to these small groups with established trust relationships. And that is really what is so exciting about Bitcoin, or more generally about public blockchain networks. So for the references, I already mentioned that in the beginning, uh, there is this paper by Alexander Behrens and myself, it's called The Case for Central Bank Electronic Money and the Non-Case for Central Bank Cryptocurrency, um, where we talk about these monetary control structures while we talk about the innovation of public cryptocurrencies and where we make the argument that um, central bank digital currency will never reach the same properties as these cryptocurrencies. CBDC, and we will talk about that in a later lecture, can be interesting, but uh, there is a huge difference between a CBDC and a, a cryptocurrency. It's, it's not the same thing in any way. And some people tend to mix them up. All right, that's it for this lecture. Uh, next time we're going to start with Bitcoin with a high level overview. Stay curious. See you soon.